The opioid crisis in this country, in this community, are at an all-time high worry rate. We're going to talk about it tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Yeah, I was recently in a, in a private conversation with uh, a, a pretty high-profile community person who has, and I'm not going to identify them because I, I just don't think it's important to the story because I think this is probably across the board, but this person was telling me that uh, in the hiring of employees these days, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find uh, young people who don't have some kind of challenge with drug interaction and more so that the opioid crisis uh, has really resonated. All you got to do is take a look at, um, well, the end game, funeral home traffic. I'm telling you, in this country, it is not good. Uh, but there's a real concern about the number of people who otherwise you wouldn't think would have drug issues are really having troubles on the job, staying on the job. And it's all because of all the things we've been talking about over the last couple of years. And there's a new solution on the ground that we're going to talk about tonight. I don't know that it's a cure for what is the systemic problem, but it certainly is a uh, a good faith finger in the dike on it. Welcome aboard. Nice to have you in. So this program is is originally being seen on Thursday night. You know that because it's Thursday night. Uh, but we're recording this on Tuesday. And so there's been a lot of stuff going on. The Alabama Senate race obviously is in the bank one way or the other. I don't know as I'm speaking to you how that turns out because I'm recording this program midday Tuesday. Uh, this happens during the holiday season with our with our, our time schedules with the program. Um, so be aware that anything that happened today is not something we can react to, but we shall as we move along. Anyway, thank you for your patience on that. Here's a headline that spurs this conversation. Uh, Providence uh, chosen to become, uh, the stations, the firehouses chosen to become safe stations for people battling opioid epidemics. Here's what was said at the announcement. The addiction epidemic that has taken over the state not only affects those trapped in it, but those who respond to it. The men and women of the Providence Fire Department realize it is no longer acceptable to be reactionary. All right, so the fire department is, is helping along this, this line, and, and Captain Zechariah Kenyon is the acting EMS chief for the Providence Fire Department. Chief, welcome. Nice to have you. Thank you. Nice to be here. And Lisa Tommaso is a former state representative and now runs the, uh, the Providence Center and is a community relations major. I, well, oh, the community relations manager runs the Providence <laughs> Center, right? Um, I don't want to, let's not cause an internal challenge over there. Uh, you, you do the, the public information work for the Providence yes. Center. And the yeah. Providence Center, I explain what it is. So the Providence Center is a community mental health center located in Providence. We service approximately 18,000 individuals who are living with mental health and substance abuse issues. Uh, we run approximately 60 programs um, in approximately 60 locations. All right. It's a big operation. It is. All right. Uh, talk to me. We, we, we got the whole program to discuss this. This is bad. And you guys are engaged in this because? Well, we're engaged in it because we see it all the time. Uh, we've been seeing it on the Providence Fire Department since I joined in 2001. It's just grown. It's gotten worse. Uh, my men and women have to deal with it on a daily basis, and it's hard. It's hard mentally and emotionally to see people over and over again uh, on the point of not breathing um, and dying and their lives wasting away. Um, Narcan is a wonderful drug. It saved many of these people and Narcan is out there more than ever but we knew we had to come up with another plan to get people some help some way and this is the plan. So how did this generate? So this was started in Manchester, New Hampshire by a firefighter up there, Chris Hickey. Uh, he has given me permission to try to replicate it here. It's also done in Nashua, New Hampshire now by uh, Chief Brian Rhodes up there. We went to visit them in Nashua and uh, got as much information as possible, and we decided that this is something that's different. We're targeting people when they're ready for help. We want to get these people uh, at a time when there's a window of opportunity to maybe really change their lives, and we decided to go for it. Um, bureaucracy, votes, administrative action, how did this whole thing become formalized? So. Uh, the state calls these uh, community overdose engagement meetings when they realize that communities have had more overdoses in a week than normal. So I went to the Providence one with uh, BHDDH and the Department of Health, 
and a lot of other players were there. And BHDDH is, is behavioral health and developmental disabilities. And hospitals. It, what? And hospitals. And hospitals. Whatever. <laughs> Big agency. Right. Important. Correct. So there's a weekly get together and jump in. I mean, this the set sometimes back and forth. So jump in, you guys. Uh, the set. It's not the, weekly. The 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 system is set up that you get weekly data, and if the data spikes, there's some kind of reaction to it? Yes, and the data is coming out of the hospitals uh, who ask information on the overdoses. So the state has implemented a 48-hour reporting mechanism through required through the Governor's Overdose uh, Prevention Intervention Task Force. That process is what now allows us to be able to immediately identify where there are spikes in opiate overdoses and be able to call together the community stakeholders and talk about what those solutions will be huh. to address the problem. That seems constructive. Yes? Yes, yes. very constructive. It, so the governor's initiative and that opioid uh, commission came up with this when? This year? It was implemented this year, yes. Yeah, because I know that she put that group together mm -hmm. at the end of last year into mm -hmm. this year. Um, and this is one of what, uh, I'm guessing a number of solutions that the commission has come up with? Yeah, the, um, the task force came task up with force. a strategy plan that identified four areas um, that needed to be, that would be addressed through a um, variety of policies. Um, so they were looking at prevention, treatment, recovery, and rescue. Okay. And this falls into, the, this falls into what category? Rescue and, or, no, well, prevent, mm -hmm. well. A few categories. Yeah. That's, right. that's mm -hmm. the beauty of it. Um, and there's actually a statewide meeting uh, for the community overdose engagement today, right now as we speak. So they're bringing everybody in the state together and hopefully they're telling people about this program that we're launching and eventually other communities will join on. All right, so what is it? I mean, what are you doing at the station? So the idea for us is simple. The station is just becoming an entry point or another vehicle for these people to enter into a program where they get help. Would they know that all 12 province fire stations uh, have their doors open? So when they're ready for help, they can come to a fire station, they can ring the doorbell, we'll bring them inside, we'll check them out, make sure there's no physical injuries or take their vital signs, make sure there's no medical emergency to treat them, uh, transport them to the ER. And if there is not, we are gonna call a number that we have at the province fire department to send out recovery coaches to the station to pick these people up and then bring them off to the next step in their treatment. Recovery coaches, who are they? Uh, recovery coaches are peers, so um, they are individuals who have lived experience that is similar to uh, the individuals that they will meet at the station. Volunteers? Uh, no, they are not. They are paid staff. They are professional uh, individuals. They have gone through a 40-hour classroom instruction. They have performed 500 hours of supervised one-on-one um, -on -one working with individuals uh, who have substance abuse. Uh, disorders and have sat for a state exam that has qualified them to be certified peer recovery specialist. So it, they are very professional people with lived experience that have really um, added great value to the mental health system. Who recruited them? They work for the Providence Center, but they for you, also for you guys. This okay. particular team does yes, but um, how many are on the team? It is actually an extension of another uh, program that the Providence Center runs. So the Providence Center, um, one of its, its goals and missions is to ensure that we are really devising community-based solutions to these problems. Uh, we have for uh, several years now been working out of EDs with um, peer recovery specialists when an individual has survived an overdose. ED. Emergency department. Gotcha. Um, we are in all of the hospitals, and that service is available 24/7. But as you can, you know, we we know, and as the uh, captain has already described, these are people who have been rescued um, with with uh, the naloxone and other treatments. So the pairs go out. They meet with them. They ask them if they would like to con to be able to be connected with other forms of treatment and recovery support services. And that process starts there for those individuals. This opportunity with Safe Stations is an opportunity for us to meet people uh, when they have decided that today's their day and it wasn't a day when they overdosed. Um, and the, I'm sure that the captain could also talk to you a little bit about the demeanor and the disposition of an individual as they're after they've been rescued from an overdose, that it's not exactly um, necessarily a place where they would 
want to be asking for help. Yeah, and okay, it's, uh, we'll do that. Uh, I got a lot more questions. I'm sure you do too. We'll continue. Stay with us. We have a prevention campaign, which we're about to kick off. We have done medical assisted treatment using our Medicaid money for that, particularly in our prison system. A little bit controversial, very effective. Uh, Governor Raimondo uh, talking about some of the task force work that has been done on the opioid crisis. Uh, the captain, who is the EMS acting chief, uh, Zachariah Kenyon from the Providence Fire Department, my guest here, and Lisa Tommaso, who's the community relations manager for the Providence Center, uh, talking about this safe stations project, uh, which is, is it up? It's up. It's running? Well, we're officially launching January 2nd. Okay. Uh, but we made the announcement um, knowing that we might get one or two people that call us. We've already had a call asking about it. Um, but we're really going to have all the staff and all the everything in place for January 2nd. H how many, it's impossible to, to know specifically, but how many people do you think we have in the city proper? Let's start with the city. Uh, dealing with this opioid addiction? Well, some of the stats that I gave yesterday at my speech, uh, the first week of December, the province fire department responded to over 60 calls for a possible overdose. So you walk that out uh, over the course of the year, that's over 3,000 people that are affected. And that's just the ones we know about. That's not the ones who are self-administering Narcan. So at every Narcan station, every EMS response crew, I mean, this is, this is, this is like daily. You, got, you guys are responding to this stuff daily. Multiple times a day. It's a mind blower. Yep. And, and I would add to that that we are amidst uh, an opioid overdose epidemic, but the truth of the matter is, is that our nation and our state is in an addiction crisis, and opioids are not the only uh, drug that are, that's being used and abused um, by our friends, neighbors, and family members. Um, there are over 90,000 people in the state of Rhode Island who are struggling with some kind of substance abuse uh, disorder. And so I think that this, this is an opportunity for us to come together and realize community-based solutions that are creative, uh, that address, I think, far more than just the opioid epidemic. Number. It's amazing. It's 10 percent, almost 10 percent of the actual population. but. Uh, take out the kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you're, you're in the 15, 20 percent of the population. One out of every five or six people that are walking the planet in Rhode Island right now are dealing with this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, and obviously, we're we're starting to get accustomed to the concept that the stereotypical drug addict is not necessarily applicable to this conversation. We've had so many shows on this to try to break that stereotype. Uh, and I think the stereotype is breaking because everyday people who are living a life in a role that wouldn't fit into the drug user category are now in it. Mm -hmm. And family members and friends see it. And a lot are in denial about it, right? So you're nodding your head, so I'll, I'll, I'll not make the speech. You're here to be the expertise on this. But our, well, you'll learn after a year or so, right, or maybe earlier, after the Safe Station program is going on, what kind of customer you're going to be dealing with here, right? Yeah, and we, you have a projection, we, Well, Captain? we've learned a lot from Manchester and Nashua, and Manchester's had over 3,000 people come through their doors in just over a year and a half. Nashua's up to about 1,300 people in just under a year. But they say it's all walks of life coming through. People are driving up from Boston to enter these programs. Uh, Again, a lot of times when the people are ready, they don't know where to go. And that's what we're really trying to target, and we're really trying to help the people that when they're ready, now they know where to go. And that that's almost 5,000 people in a year and a half in New Hampshire. We're denser uh, as far as population in the city of Providence. We have other communities around us that may wander in. So we're expecting to be busy, and we're expecting to change some lives. Well, what kind of clientele are we talking about at the Providence Center? Uh, the Providence Center services um, a wide demographic group of individuals from, you know, less than a year old to 100, uh, all walks of life, homeless to, you know, highly affluent. Uh, there is no discrimination, uh, socioeconomic, race, ethnicity, sex, 
um, and with this disease. No, but so so talk to me about. Um, I, I, listen, I'm concerned about everybody who's got this kind of a problem, but I'm really fascinated about the, uh, I don't, for lack of a better term, the, uh, the middle income and higher professional person who, again, had a tooth pulled, mm -hmm. right? Got on the Percocet or the whatever the heck it is and stayed with it and all of a sudden, you know, liked the feeling and ran out of the script, was probably offered too much in the script to begin with, got involved with it, and then ended up you know, shopping on the street, and then all jammed up. Are those the kind of people that are coming in, to, or do you think, do you project to be coming into the station? I think we're gonna have all kinds of people, to be honest with you. And, uh, Cause you there's know, an ego check involved with admission of, of addiction. So I'd prefer not to call it an ego check, but more stigma. That's what it is. People do not ask for help or come forward and admit that they are in need of help because of stigma. Well, stigma affects ego, so I guess we shouldn't argue the semantics, mm. but I think we're both talking about the same thing, right? You know, the guy in the jacket and the tie or the gal that you know, wears a dress to work every day, you know, has a couple of kids at home and, you know, 401k, plays a little golf, you know, does mm -hmm. community service, uh, goes to church, but, you know, had a backache you know, or a, a disc surgery, and now two years later is hooked. You know, are they gonna come down to the station? I hope so, because that person needs to change, hopefully for the better. I mean, if you look, Chris Heron's a perfect example of that, right? Sure. Somebody who had it all, who started on pills and ended up at a Dunkin' Donuts drive-thru with a needle in his arm. Right, you know? I mean, that, that his it's, story is incredible, yeah. but you know, I just wonder, I mean, thank God for this program, and it seems like it's going to be wonderful. I just wonder about the stigma thing and how many lives the stigma itself is taking because people, A, as you said, don't really know where to go. I mean, do you go back to the doctor? Like, the doctor who prescribed you the medicine in the first place? I don't know. Is that what's happening? Well, that's the problem. People really don't know where to go. They may recognize that they are struggling and that what started out as a need for some real medical pain has now turned into something else, uh, not really even recognizing necessarily what it is. Um, but being able to ask for help, as you said, you know, looking, considering your ego, I guess, but I think mu it's much more to do with what other people think of well, you. What's your self image? It's your self image. And uh, look, nobody wants, nobody in any walk of life wants to be identified as somebody who's got a drug addiction. Which is what's great about safe stations. Um, it is a place where you can walk in and ask questions, you can ask for help, and it's the kind of place that within the community, individuals know that that's where I get help. I get, I can get medical help, I can find information. So it's, it's a great gateway for people to be able to take that first step when they've made the choice that they want to. The trick to all of that though really is, um, I would say on our end, making sure that once that person decides that they would like treatment, because this is also the conversation that we're having in our state and many others, as to whether or not we can make that smooth transition and um, be able to process a person and get them assessed and have them handed off to the appropriate level of care that they need. Confidentiality guaranteed? Absolutely. Any station, any time. That's our slogan. Get in the door, we'll help you out. The rank and file firefighters who are hanging out at the station getting ready to save somebody else from a fire three hours later, see you walking in saying, listen, I heard I could get some help, I'm in trouble. They keep quiet about it. They should. There's no community chatter about it. I mean, these are the no. things that people are worried about, right? We just had training for uh, the 83 new people that came on the job uh, through one of the recovery services. So those people are trained. Uh, the rest of our members are very seasoned as to know to, you know, keep people private. Mm -hmm. And that's our goal. Our goal is to help you out without letting the universe know that and you've I, got a problem. And I, I think I, I want the, the captain to talk to us about the empathy that uh, the fire department has for this because, again, they're seeing this thing every single day. Some final thoughts when we come back. Stay with us. All right, Captain, I know you wanted to talk about this safe station project uh, and, and everybody that came together. So, uh, 
a, a unique Rhode Island collaborative, so to speak? It is. So uh, I do have to thank Director Rebecca Boss from BHDDH. Uh, she really helped stimulate this conversation and get things going. But it's only been two months since we started, since I proposed this idea at that code meeting. And here we are saying that we're going to launch. We've had uh, some funding provided to us, one through a grant that the Providence Center worked on uh, very quickly, two and a half weeks for a national grant. Thirteen people were awarded it, and they were one of them, which is amazing um, in that time frame. But we've had plenty of providers um, from Butler Hospital to the Providence Center to BHDDH, Department of Health, City of Providence, Providence Fire Department, and uh, it's truly um, amazing to get everybody on the same page and this quickly. this is not limited to the City of Providence residents? Uh, no, it People is not. People can come into the fire stations in Providence. Well, we'll see what the population is. You know, we'll see what kind of flow that you have there. Yep. Uh, you got to feel good about this. I mean, you went to a meeting, you came with a brainstorm, and all of a sudden it's materializing. It's got to be rewarding. Yeah, it, it when is. save some lives, it'll be even more rewarding. Yes, and that's, that's the goal. And uh, as I said yesterday, if we can save one, we've accomplished something. Uh, cliche, but yes, not it's really, true. right? right. Uh, but the reality on the ground right now is, is, is that there's a lot of misunderstanding amongst the marketplace buying drugs, what they're actually buying, correct? Right? Yes. yes. We were talking during the break that mm -hmm. there's a lot of bad stuff out there right now. Yeah, heroin so is not heroin. Heroin no. is fentanyl. Fentanyl is being discolored. That it is all, you know, people who've got a little, you know, a little social cocaine problem better know their dealer because, you know, and even, I, I say that facetiously, right? I'm not promoting the kind of activity. Yeah. But, right, there's a lot of... The, the problem with fentanyl is it's much stronger than the heroin that people used to be using. And now they're coming up with even stronger fentanyl that's Lights hitting out. the street. Lights out. Lights out. And again, I, I think that it's important that people know where they can access help because the truth of the matter is is that addiction is a disease that affects your brain. And while you and I can sit here and rationally say that um, be careful who you buy from if, if as a course of safety, it doesn't matter to a person whose brain the most powerful tool that we all have that usually keeps us safe and protects us from, from harm is actually telling you to do something that's dangerous and bad for you. So when an individual is ready to ask for help, that they recognize that today is the day that I want to try that, we need to make sure that we have resources that are available, that they can be connected with the service that they need. Because in that moment, their brain is not their enemy. All right, we will link on Fox Providence to all the information that the Providence Center and uh, the Safe Stations program has for you. But the bottom line is effective right after the first of the year. January 2nd. Just, just stop by a Providence fire station, anyone you can find, and say, I need help, and the balls will start rolling, correct? Any station, any time. That's the slogan. Ring the bell. And, we'll get you help. And, and Lexi was mentioning during the break, too, people like firefighters. <laughs> and they feel, you know, probably easier to talk to a firefighter than a doctor or a police officer mm -hmm. about the situation, right? Yes. There's an empathy that the firefighters have. And you've seen enough bad stuff on the street that there's no judgment zone there, right? No, not at all. All right. No questions asked. Captain, great idea. Thank you. You miss being a rep? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, first of the year, information on factorprovidence.com. Thanks, guys. Happy holidays. Happy Thank you. Year. Same to you. Uh, final word next. Tomorrow night, we'll revisit our conversation with the state treasurer on things financial for the state and uh, the Paw Sox project and its financing and all of that, all right? So Seth Magaziner, a revisit tomorrow night. See you on the radio at 3 as well on WPRL. Thanks for watching. Good night.